I'm a little embarrassed by all the things that Brother James said, but I do want to say, James, thank you. You're so kind. And I want to thank you as a congregation for inviting me to come and be with you during this summer lectureship series. It's a real blessing to be back in Ripley. For about a year, we, along with Paul and Glenda, our son and his wife, I would come maybe once a month, but he'd be here maybe two or three times a month on weekends. And we thoroughly enjoyed working with this congregation, and you folks blessed our lives. And I want you to know that we are very grateful for what you have done for us. And I want to add that I'm very grateful for what you are doing for us. One of the main reasons that we're able to publish the Magnolia Messenger and send it out to more than 30,000 addresses is because you help us do that. And I've come tonight to say thank you so very, very much. I won't take up much time about the Magnolia Messenger, but there may be someone in the audience that is not familiar with this publication. This is the most recent issue. I have a few copies with me. If you're not receiving the messenger and would like to do so, all you need to do is just give us your name and your address. And we'll add you to our growing mailing list. Give it to me or to Brother Josh or Brother James or one of the elders or whoever you want to and just say, get it to the Franks and we'll be glad to add your name to our mailing list. Several of you have asked us about Paul, our son. He is seriously ill. Paul is so different from what he used to be. Um, he's not able to function in a normal way. He still does some things. He's still able to drive around town. He doesn't drive out on the main highways. His wife, Glenda, takes care of that. He is undergoing some treatment right now. He also has been taken to a, another specialist this past week. In fact, this week, this is Wednesday, I believe they went yesterday to visit a neurologist in Greenwood, Mississippi. They're going to do some further tests this coming week, a week from tomorrow, in an effort to determine for sure what the exact diagnosis is as to his ailment. So many of you have said that you have been praying. Many of you signed a card and sent it to Paul. The other day he came to us and with a grin on his face, he said, look what I got from Ripley. Thank you, brothers, sisters, for what you've done. Thank you most of all for your prayers. And I want you to know that I believe that God has the power to do whatever he sees fit. It is our earnest prayer that Paul will soon be back to normal and can be involved in the work that he was doing previous to the time that he became ill. Continue to pray, and may God bless us all. What I'm about to say is not going to come as a surprise to you. I'm going to simply state, I love the church. And what I have just said, I believe you probably could echo and would be glad to do so. You also love the church. And by the church, we're talking about the Lord's church. The church that Jesus promised to build. When he told Simon Peter and his other apostles, upon this rock, upon the confession that Peter had just made, that Jesus was the Son of God, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. And I love the church that Jesus built. And I believe you do also. When you and I say that we love the church, we can be assured that we're in good company because Jesus talks about 
or the Bible speaks about Jesus' love for the church. You remember that very familiar passage in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 that speaks to the relationship of husbands and wives and compares that to the relationship of Christ to his church. In one of those verses in chapter 5, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. I'm in good company. You're in good company when we say we love the church because Jesus loved, loves, present tense, loves the church. He loved the church so much, the Bible says, he gave himself for it. He died for the church. And greater love hath no man than this, than to lay down his life. For someone that he loves. I love the church. You love the church. Jesus loves the church. We are in good company with our Lord. Another passage that emphasizes the love that our Lord has for the church is found in the book of Acts chapter 20. Where the apostle Paul wrote to the, or the apostle Paul was speaking to the elders of the church at Ephesus and Luke records this statement where he said to the elders, you are to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. In this context, Jesus is referred to as God. Some versions say the Lord, but Jesus, the Lord is God. He is a divine being. Now, while he was upon earth, he was flesh and blood. He came as a human to live among us and to show to us how God wants us to live. That's why he is our example. But anyway, the church of God, which was purchased with the blood of Christ. And anytime someone sheds his blood for something Anytime someone gives his life for something, you can be assured that that something is worth a lot. And there's a lot of love involved there. Jesus loved the church so much that he gave himself for it. He died for it. He suffered as no man has ever suffered before because he loves the church. When I tell you that I love the church, I think you have a right to ask me why I love the church. When you tell me that you love the church, I have a right to ask you, why do you love the church? Now, I'm speaking tonight, and you're so kind as to be sitting there and listening. So in a way, I'm going to speak for you. I'm going to say what I believe you would want to say if you were up here where I am now. I love the church. There are reasons why I love the church. You love the church. There are reasons why you love the church. What are those reasons? I want to share with you about four or five reasons that I love the church and I believe I'm speaking for you. You love the church for the same reasons I love the church. Number one, I love the church because it is the body of Christ. It is the spiritual body of Christ. Many times in the scriptures, the Bible speaks of the church as the body. And we know, of course, that it's the body of Christ. He is the head of the church. The church is his body the body that consists of many members. And thank God, if you're a Christian, you are a part of that body. How can I love the church without loving the body of Christ? I ask you, how could you love me without loving what you see, this body, this physical body? Now, I'm more than just a body. 
I'm a soul. I have a soul. I'm a spirit. But what we see and what is now talking and what you are hearing is coming from this body. And we love the church because the church is the body of Christ. Have you ever heard someone say, I love Christ, but I don't care about his body? That's what they're really saying when they say, I love Christ, but I'm not too concerned about the church. If we're talking about the body of Christ, the church of Christ, then if we love Christ, we cannot help but love his body. Isn't it wonderful that the body consists of many members and you and I are privileged to be one of those members? And is there a member of your own physical body that is unimportant? Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 draws a parallel between the human body and its members and the body of Christ and its members and he emphasizes that every member of the physical body is important and every member of the spiritual body of Christ is important. That means that you are, that means that you are a very important part. You are a very important person. There are no unimportant parts in your physical body. There are no unimportant members in the spiritual body of Christ. Okay. The Ripley congregation is just one congregation, but there are many members. And those who are a part of the Ripley church make up the body of Christ in this community, or at least along with some other congregations. By the way, it was quite a shock to us to learn that there was a death over at the West Ripley Church. When my wife told me about seeing it on Facebook, I believe. Any of you look at Facebook? No, no, I don't want, to ask, I don't want you to tell me. To. It's, it's pretty popular, isn't it? We learn a lot. She learns a lot and she shares some of it with me. But anyway, when we learned about it, it was sad to think that there was a group of people in Ripley, Mississippi, identified as a church of Christ where there had been something very terrible to take place. But we love the body. We love the congregation. And I love the church tonight because I love the body of Christ. And I cannot say that I love the body of Christ unless I am saying I love you as a part of that body. So why do we say we love the church? Reason number one, because it is the body of Christ. Number two, a reason why I love the church is because it is the family of God. You know, when you start talking about family, you're talking about something that's very important. I can't help but be impressed with so many of you who came up to us a while ago as we were coming into the building and standing around for a little while and expressed your concern because Paul, our oldest son, is seriously ill. That is family. Family is precious. And when you face problems like you have faced in your family, and oh, you love each member so much, would you not say that your family is very precious? And since the Bible teaches in the book, well, like I believe it's 1 Timothy, along about chapter 3 or 4 that talks about the house of God, which is the church of the living God. We use the word house and family interchangeably quite frequently, and I think rightly so. The church is God's house. The church is God's family. And how can we not love the church since the church is the family of God? And here again, we are part of that family. We were blessed a while ago to go to a, a restaurant called Bishop's. They had some excellent food down there. 
I may not remember what I ate, but I'll remember the people that I was with when we sat around the table and ate together. We were enjoying fellowship one with the other because there were three brothers and three sisters sitting at that one table. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, in the family. I love the church because it's the family of God. How can we not love our brothers and our sisters? I'm so grateful that when announcements are made from this very podium where I'm now standing and this stand, quite often you hear the names of people that are ill or maybe the name of a person who has departed this life. Dr. Walden, I remember back when I preached over, over here, he's usually sitting right over here on my left, up close to the front. We mention these names because these names represent people that we learn to love and appreciate. So when we say we love the church, we're simply saying we love our family. And what a blessing it is that all of us can say that we have a heavenly Father. God is our Father. How miserable life would be if we didn't have that very special relationship so that we could call upon the creator of the universe, the giver of life, the sustainer of life, and ask him to be with us and bless us. Prayer has become more important. It's become more precious because I realize I have a father in heaven that I can go to at any time and from any place about anything that's on my mind. That's the privilege of prayer. And I believe with all my heart, brethren, that power, that there's power in prayer because we have a Father who loves us. Jesus talked about that in his teachings, you remember? He talked about sparrows, little old birds that fly around that we consider worthless. And yet he said, even the little birds like the sparrows, when they fall to the ground, your father has knowledge of that. Your father has knowledge of when a sparrow dies and falls to the ground. How much more so does our heavenly father have knowledge of us and cares for us and provides for us? Yes, I love the church because the church is God's family. I love the church number three because the church is the saved. Let me ask you a question. Are you saved? If you hesitate to answer that question, let me ask another one. Are you lost? There's a big gap between being lost and being saved. This past Sunday afternoon, it was my privilege to sit down with a 23-year-old young man and talk to him about his past life and some changes that he had recently made in his life. And I'll tell you what, it was exciting to sit there and hear him talk with excitement about the changes that had taken place in his life. And what he was really describing was how he had gone from the state of the lost to the state of the saved. He has salvation now. He has salvation in Christ. And by the way, that salvation is in the church. Because you remember in Acts chapter 2, when those thousands of people cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The apostle Peter told them what to do involving repentance and being baptized. And there were about 3,000 people that responded and were baptized into Christ. And the Bible says, I believe in the last verse of chapter 2, that the Lord added them, the saved, or added them to the church, 
or those who were being saved were added to the church. Also in Ephesians chapter 5, where the Bible talks about Jesus being the head of the body, the Bible teaches that Jesus is the Savior of the body. The body is the church. Jesus is the Savior of the church. Jesus adds those who are saved to His church. And today, I love the church because it is the saved. Aren't you glad? Aren't you thankful that if you had a heart attack in the next two minutes, you would go to be with the Lord? People do die in church services. Or down in Kosciuszko, Mississippi, where we live, there was a little church about nine miles south of us where a man was leading singing one Sunday morning. And when he finished leading the song right before the sermon, as I recall the story, he sat down and then he just fell over. He was dead. About nine miles north of Kosciuszko, not too many years separating these events, there was a fellow who attended services every time the church doors were opened. His name was Sanders. He was joking and talking with the people before services began, and about the time services began, he also succumbed, he fell, and he was pronounced dead. You could die tonight. Isn't it wonderful to know that we are saved? And do we not see the connection between salvation and the church? Jesus Christ came to do what? To seek and to save the lost. What did He do? He came and built the church. He adds the saved to the church. He is the Savior of the body. There are no saved people outside of the body of Christ. I'm talking about responsible people who are accountable to God. Saved people are in the body of Christ. Saved people are in the church that belongs to Jesus Christ. I love the church because the church is the saved. Oh, how blessed we are. I love the church because it stands for everything that's good and right. We've got a lot of people and a lot of organizations that practice that which is evil, that which is bad. And we've got people that encourage others to do wrong. But the church of the living God is an institution that believes in God's word and respects his power as revealed in his word and seeks to do what is good and what is right. I'm so thankful to be a part of the church because we represent a group of people that want to do what's right and we want to do what's good. And that's worth loving the church. I'm so grateful that the church stands for everything that's good and everything that's right. Let me make a fifth point. And I'm going to break this into about three parts. I love the church because the church meets the needs that I have. The real needs that I have in life. Now I've already talked about some, but I'm going to add two or three other things to what I've already said. As a human being, as a person, I really have a need to belong to something that's bigger than I am and more important than I am. People join clubs all the time. They become part of organizations all the time because there is that inward need to belong to something that's really important. And brethren, there's nothing on earth as important as the church of our Lord. But to belong to the greatest institution in the world, isn't that a wonderful blessing, a great privilege? If you are a Christian, and I believe most everybody here tonight would say that you are, if you are a member of the body of Christ, and I would hope everybody here, most everybody could say that you are, then you belong to something that's the greatest. There is no greater organization. There is no greater institution and by the way, it really bothers me when I see people get so involved in human organizations 
to the degree that they actually neglect the greatest institution in all the world, the church of the living God. The sense of belonging. Also, the need for fellowship. One of the greatest needs we all have is to have friends, to have someone we can converse with, someone we can talk with. And that's where the church comes in. The church provides a wonderful atmosphere where we can enjoy each other and we can have fellowship one with another. And we don't always have to eat at bishops to have that fellowship. We can stand out there in the foyer and we can talk with each other. We go into each other's homes and we can visit with each other and enjoy this fellowship. We need that so very much. Probably the saddest people in the world are those who feel they're all alone and have no one they can really feel close to. The church satisfies this basic human need. And I don't know exactly how to say what I'm going to say, but we all need help too. Is there anyone here that never needs someone to help you? I need help. Constantly I depend on others to help me. And I'm sure you do also. And the church provides that help. We are, we are designed by the Lord to serve one another. That's what we're all for. We're all a part of the body of Christ. And our objective should be to serve each other, help each other. What did Jesus come to earth to do? Not to be served, but to serve. He set the perfect example he even went so far as to wash the dirty feet of his disciples. Service. He fed the hungry. He provided uh, healing for people that were ill. The Lord went about doing good. So Acts 10 verse 38 says, He went about doing good. And that's the kind of attitude we need to have because the church is a helping, serving group of people. And we help each other. And we serve each other. I love the church. And you do too. And we can give reasons why we love the church. And I'm grateful for each of these reasons. Let me recap. I love the church because it's the body of Christ. I love the church because we are the family of God. I love the church because it is the saved. I love the church because it stands for what is good and for what is right. I love the church because it truly meets the needs that I have. The need for belonging, the need for fellowship, the need for help. And all of us need help at times. Okay. I've told you why I love the church. I hope I've been speaking for you as well. But there's one more part of the lesson tonight that I feel I must also present. Because when I talk about the church, when I talk about loving the church, back in my mind, I can't help but think about the fact that there's a problem somewhere. There's a problem in the church. There's a problem within the church. And you know what that problem is? Imperfect people. And we have problems with imperfect people. The Lord, through the Apostle Paul, compared the Lord and His church to a husband and his wife in Ephesians 5. We've already made reference to that. And in this uh, parallel uh, illustration or illustration the Lord uses, putting them in parallel, let's think about a husband and a wife. Let me ask you this. Are you a husband? Okay, you are. Another question, are you perfect? 
You want me to ask your wife? See what she says? All right, wives, you are a wife. Are you a perfect wife? Husbands might be a little more reluctant to say, but nevertheless, we all know we're imperfect. What I'm really saying tonight is that when it comes to the church, that church that we love so dearly, the church that we love with all of our heart because we love Jesus, is not a perfect church. Oh, there's one side to the church that's perfect. We may call this the divine side. It's perfect. You can't improve upon God's arrangement for the church. Let me give you some uh, reasons why I'm saying that. Take, for example, the matter of the origin of the church. How did the church get started? Was it an accident? Was it an afterthought? No. The Bible teaches, if you look carefully, beginning in the book of Genesis and going right on down through the Old Testament scriptures involving the work of John the Baptist and the early New Testament teachings, the church was in the mind of God. It was in God's scheme for the redemption of man from the very beginning, even before the worlds began. The church was in the mind of God. The origin of the church originated with God. Thousands of years were used by the Lord to prepare for the beginning of the world's greatest kingdom, the world's greatest institution, the church of Jesus Christ. The origin is perfect. The organization of the church is perfect. It's perfect because Jesus, the perfect one, is the head of the church. There's no such thing as a body having two or three heads. The church, which is the body of Christ, does not have more than one head. The head of the church is Christ. He is the head, and He is the only head, and He is perfect. The head gives direction. The head controls through the mind. Jesus Christ is perfect as the head of His church. The church then is perfect in origin. It is perfect as far as its headship is concerned. And let me add this. In order for a local congregation to be mature, to be complete, and that's one definition of perfect, not necessarily sinless in this context, the church is to have a specific organization. You are very familiar. I, I'm sure everyone here is. If not, maybe I can fill in a gap or two that you might need to think about. According to the New Testament, the organization of the church consists of Jesus Christ as the head, the one and the only head. There is no earthly head. Over each local congregation, it's God's intent that there be overseers that there be bishops. We may use the word elder more frequently, or elders. We might use the word presbyter on a limited way. Or sometimes today we may hear the term pastors or shepherds. All six of these words refer to the organization of the church. And when it comes to the organization of the church for a local congregation to have elders to have overseers, to have shepherds, is God's plan, and we can't improve on that plan. It's a perfect plan. What about the way you get into the church? The Lord gives us a plan. It's perfect. Do you want to be a member of the Lord's church? It was on the day of Pentecost when the Apostle Peter was up preaching Jesus Christ that he lived among men, that he did miracles, that he proved himself to be the Son of God. But in spite of that, those wicked people took Jesus and crucified him because of the Jewish leaders of the day who refused to listen to him and were envious of the influence that Jesus was having, so they had him put to death on a cross. But he didn't remain dead 
On the third day he came out of that tomb alive, very much alive, and alive forevermore. That's the gospel. And on that day of Pentecost, when those people heard the preaching of the apostle Peter, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, you need to repent. Repent you, every one of you, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. The plan of salvation is given on Pentecost and repeated numerous times in the Bible, especially as you read the examples of conversion in the book of Acts. Over and over again, the Bible teaches that the terms of admission into the body of Christ, the plan of salvation involves faith in Jesus, repentance of our sins, making known our faith in the Lord, confession, and being baptized by the authority of Christ for the remission of our sins. And the Bible teaches that baptism puts us into Christ. It puts us into the body of Christ. It puts us into the church of Christ. And there is no other plan of salvation given in God's Word. That's a perfect plan. The divine side is perfect. The same could be said about the worship of the early church. We go back to the New Testament, we learn how they worshiped. And for the sake of time, I'll go ahead and say, we go back to the New Testament and we learn the mission of the church. The mission of the church is the Great Commission. Carry the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every soul. The mission of the church. That's perfect. The destiny of the church. Oh, how wonderful that is. One day, and it may not be very long, and it won't be long for some of us, we're going to be in the presence of our blessed Lord. Death will have occurred. Our heart would have stopped beating, and our lungs would stop expanding and contracting, and death would come and take the spirit from this old body of clay and take it into the very presence of the Lord. I'm telling you, there is no destiny greater than than that awaiting a child of God, a member of the Lord's church. The destiny is perfect. Heaven is perfect. I'm almost through. But there's something that's not perfect. And this is what causes a lot of congregations to have problems. There's something about the church that's not perfect. With all due respect to what happened in Ripley last Sunday, you and I certainly would have to agree that something that was not perfect took place. Because human beings... I don't know the details, and I'm not a judge in any of this matter, any of these matters. But we're dealing with human... Let me ask, my wife is here with me tonight. Thank the Lord. I don't think I'd have come without her. By the way, Brother uh, James said something about me flying an airplane. I probably would have flown up here if my wife would have flown with me. She used to fly everywhere I went almost everywhere I went and she'd jump in that airplane and we'd take off day or night rain or sunshine there are a few times she wished she hadn't have taken off with me but I seriously thought about flying up here but one reason I didn't want to fly is because she really don't much like to fly anymore she'd rather get in a vehicle that has wheels that roll on the ground it doesn't bother her if those wheels roll pretty fast, but she likes that kind of travel. But one reason that I'm, I drove up here is because I wanted my wife to be with me. So now I want to talk about my wife a little bit. She's the closest thing to being perfect that I think you could find on this earth. But that being said, she's still not perfect. 
Every once in a while, she'll get carried away and she'll tell me how much she loves me and how, I don't know, she almost gives me the impression that she thinks I'm perfect, but then on the other hand, maybe a day or so later, something comes up and I learn she doesn't think I'm perfect either. <laughs> what are we talking about? We're talking about people. Wives, husbands, church members. You're one of them, aren't you? By the way, if you're not, I hope you'll soon be a member of the Lord's Church, the greatest institution in the world, and I hope you'll love the church so much you'll get out and tell other people about the church, and they'll be influenced to become what you are. But people are not perfect. When you go back to the New Testament and you read about the early church, they had some imperfect people in the church. You remember in the church at Jerusalem, for example, Church hadn't been established very long until there was a problem about uh, people had needs, physical needs. And so the decision was made that those who had possessions, who had properties, lands, houses, or whatever, they would volunteer. It was a volunteer act. They would sell their possessions and their goods, and they would bring the money and lay it down at the apostles' feet, and then the apostles would see that it was distributed among those who had needs. Lo and behold, there was a man in the church, a woman in the church, in that first church of Christ in Jerusalem. They sold a possession, and they came up with the idea, we want to be recognized for our generosity. So they concocted a story how that they had sold their property, let's say for a thousand dollars. Now the Bible doesn't tell us how much they sold it for, but I'm trying to make it where you can see it, visualize it. They sold it for a thousand dollars, but they were going to give the impression that they only got three hundred dollars for it. So they bought a part of the price of the land and they laid it at the apostles' feet. Now that would have been all right, but here's what happened. In the church at Jerusalem, there were two liars. They lied about money. They lied about how much they had gotten for the sale of that property, and they lied about how much they were giving to the Lord. Liars in the church. Thank God that doesn't happen in Mississippi. Well, also... In the church of the first century, there were several other characters. A man named Demas, he had been a co-worker with Paul, a fellow laborer with Paul, and then Paul had to write along about the last part of his writing and say, Demas has forsaken me. Having loved this present world, Demas turned his back upon Paul. Let me tell you, brethren, when he turned his back upon Paul, a dedicated servant of God, he turned his back upon the Lord. Demas hath forsaken me. He hath forsaken the Lord because of his love for the world. The church of the first century had its people who were not perfect. Even one of the apostles, Judas, turned out to be a betrayer. Same thing could be said about other men of the first century. Not perfect. I want to close the lesson tonight by saying that in spite of the church being imperfect, don't we still love the church? Isn't it great to be a part of a congregation that has some imperfect people, maybe all of us to some degree, imperfect. We all make mistakes. But yet we are trying to serve God. We're dedicated. We're diligent in our efforts. Oh yes it is. Wow, what a blessing it is to be in the church of the living God. Tonight let's go back and say we love the church. In spite of its imperfections human beings are going to make mistakes there are going to be people that will lie. There are going to be people that will go back into the world. There are going to be people that will forsake the Lord. But we still love the church. My challenge in closing is, let's don't just talk about loving the church. 
My wife doesn't want me to just tell her repeatedly that I love her. And I can say I don't want her to tell me repeatedly that she loves me. I want her to show that she loves me. And she wants me to show that I love her. Let's show that we love the church. Let's get behind this congregation. Let's get behind Brother Josh in his work. Let's get behind these elders and these deacons. The other people like Brother James who's freely giving of his time and his efforts. These who lead singing and just, I could go on and on and mention those who are workers in this congregation. Let's get behind them and let's show that we not only say we love the church, but let's show that we love the church. And I'm telling you, brethren, when we do that, the people of the community are going to be able to see it. And we're going to have an impact that we may find surprising. One of the things that characterized the early church was, Behold how they love each other. Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And you can't love the church without loving one another. My final appeal tonight, my final appeal tonight is a question. Are you a member of the Lord's church? Are you a faithful member of the Lord's church? You can become a member tonight the very same way they did back in the first century. You know, the, one, of the, one of the greatest pleas that we can make in our world today is let's restore to the best of our ability New Testament Christianity. Let's go back to the Bible. Let's do Bible things in Bible ways. And let's tell people what the Bible says, how we become Christians, how we become a member of the Lord's church. And tonight, if you've never shown your faith in Jesus as the Son of God, if you've never really repented of your sins and changed your course of direction and made changes in your daily life, if you've never confessed the wonderful name of Jesus, He is God's Son, and you believe in Him, you believe He's your Savior, and you're going to allow Him to be your Lord. And you do that by submitting to His command to be baptized immersed in water for the remission of your sins, that you may be saved, that you may enter Christ, enter His body, enter His church. Can we help you do that? If you're a member of the church and you've not been living as you ought, you, let me rephrase that. If you're a member of the church and you've not been showing that you truly love the church, tonight may be a wonderful opportunity for you to say, I'm going to start showing I really love the church. And people around me are going to see that I love the church in spite of old oh, so-and-so that's not exactly what he ought to be or that woman that sometimes hurts me. I'm going to be a faithful Christian regardless and I'm going to show that I love the church. We're going to sing a song of invitation and this is an opportunity for you to say at least where you are. Some of you may want to come forward, but let's all together say we love the Lord's church. May God help us to do that. If we can help you, come while we stand and sing.